بخير الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد ما دي أسبكتد علماء distinguished imams our dear beloved elders brothers and sisters and our dear children assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu i've been asked to moderate today's program and the topic of our panel discussion it is something that is at home it is in the neighborhood it is in our country, it's an international problem, and that is dangers surrounding youth. We often hear that the youths and the children of today are the children, i sorry, are the leaders of tomorrow. They are the next generation. So the question that comes to mind is, if our youths are in danger today, then what would the future hold? So this is just one of the things, inshallah, we'll be discussing. And um, just to give you a little breakdown of our program, firstly, inshallah, we would have a short discourse on certain aspects of the topic by our distinguished panelists, and then, we we'll open the floor for your questions and discussion. So I now take great opportunity to introduce each of our, each of our panelists and to also introduce the discourse that each of the panelists will be dealing with. So we have start on the right. Morana Sean. Morana Sean, mashallah, he is uh, graduated alum. He is a lecturer, you know, throughout the country, even in the islands. Um, Maulana Sean has served as the Dean of Discipline for about six or seven years, probably more than that. He still assists in the responsibility as the Dean of Discipline. He was an Imam, he is presently an Assistant Imam, and he has worked considerably amongst the youths. Then we have, well, mashallah, you like to welcome Brother Yazid, Imam Deen. Um, Brother Yazid, he has um, done considerable amount of work in the area of secular and social guidance. He's a quality assurance officer, has a master's in education. Um, and mashallah, he has a list of different qualification after his name. He asked me not to mention all of them, so I'll respect that. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Um, he is here with us um, to contribute his expertise in the in the topic. To my left, I have Mufti Abdurrahman. Mufti Abdurrahman, he is a Mufti and Alim. Um, he has done several lecturing throughout the country, islands and so on as well. He has a lot of experience in counseling. Also, he works with the youth. And to my far left, we have our distinguished Imam, Dr. Hassim Ali. He has his master's and bachelor's in social sciences. Amongst other things, he is a professional counselor, a clinical consultant. And we know Dr. Hassim, he has been very foremost in training trainers in the fields of counseling and dealing with youth. So, with this team of, you know, experts on my side, mashallah, we see that we will have a very fruitful and um, top-level discussion on the, on the topic. So, to start the discussion this evening, we we'll request Maulana Sean, who will speak for about four and a half to five minutes on defining dangers to youths and also identifying areas of dangers that youths are facing. Maulana Sean. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Allahumma yassiru wa asiru wa tammim bil khair wa bika nasta'in ya fattah. 
as Mufti Kayam has, has mentioned, that inshallah my responsibility is dealing with the definition of danger or defining what is danger or the dangers to youths and then identifying some key areas of danger towards the youths or that surrounds the youths and I'm given five minutes. So before I start I would, I would like to begin by defining what is the dictionary meaning of danger. What is the dictionary meaning of danger? In the dictionary, the meaning of danger, it means the liability or exposure to harm or injury, risk or peril. So this is basically the definition of danger. Now, with that in mind, we would have done that word harm. And uh, danger can be termed as causing physical harm, harm by means which is physically, it can be emotionally, it can be spiritually or religiously, or it can be economically or socially. So these are the various areas with regards to, you know, harm. So I'll just break down it in a little so that we can have a clear understanding about what are the various areas that surrounds the youth in particular with regards to dangers. So I will use the both terms harm and danger you know, intermittently, meaning that I sometimes I will use the word harm, sometimes I will use the word danger. But before I begin, I would like to mention what the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned about harm or danger. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا ضرر لا ضرر ولا ضرر ولا ضرر do not cause harm nor do you reciprocate harm. Do not, do not be the means of causing harm. Do not assist and aid in causing harm. So it, from this we can understand clearly, as a Muslim, we should not encourage, we should not cause harm to other persons, we should not cause harm to ourselves, nor should we be the means, whether directly or indirectly, of causing harm. So I would like to identify approximately five common areas that the youths generally face with regards to harm and danger. The first one is physical harm or physical danger. And this will include violence, especially amongst our youths. There's violence, then there's physical abuse. And this is very prevalent amongst our youths, physical abuse. The second common area of danger or harm is emotional or mental harm. And this comes about through means of verbal abuse, right? Bullying, all of these things. Sometimes it can even come about by, through substance abuse. A person, you know, he's, uh, he's, abuse, he's using drugs as the case may be. This is another area. Then thirdly, we have what is known as religious or spiritual abuse or um, religious or spiritual harm. So a person may say, how can I be harmed spiritually or religiously? Now, this can be done by a person committing sin, not following the laws of Allah and his Rasul. And once a person does not follow deen, he does not adopt himself to a religion, worshipping Allah, recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then automatically he is opening himself to spiritual danger. Right? Then we have what is known as economical right economical danger or harm and this can be through making poor financial decisions sometimes as youths you know we inherit from our parents we are given wealth and this wealth we are given we don't utilize it because we don't seek proper guidance we don't have that proper guidance so we make poor financial decision we squander the wealth so this is economical danger then we have social danger and social danger it is a very broad topic and alhamdulillah we have people here like brother has, um, our brother Dr. Hassan. Hassan, he is able, Hassan, sorry, he's able to deal with that in detail. And we speak like about the ills of society, you know, especially dealing with social media and all of these things, Have, trying to find an identity, especially our youths, they try and they strive sometimes to find an identity in society. So all of these are challenges and dangers that surround our youths. And if it is not dealt with in the correct manner, then it can destroy them not only as a youth, but even 
as an, adult, as an adult. And by doing so, it can even destroy a community. It can even destroy the ummah at large. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would like to close with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Man dara, dara Allahu bi. Whoever causes harm, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will harm him. وَمَنْ شَاقَ شَاقَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ And whoever he is harsh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is harsh upon him. So this is also an, in the, you know, an incentive for us that we should not create means of causing harm to our youths, but we should try to help them. We should try to be soft with them, try to be you know, reasonable with them, and try to you know, deal with things in an appropriate manner. وَأَخْرُ دَعْوَانًا الْحَمْدِ اللَّهِ رَبْ لَهِمْ So Jazakra Mawlana Shon, he has identified in a broad manner, the different types of dangers that exist. Um, all of us live in an environment, and um, environment can be defined in different ways. Um, dealing from a psychosocial effect, cultural effect, you know, we had asked um, Dr. Hassim to deal with how the environment impacts youth behavior from a psychosocial and cultural um, aspect. Dr. Hassim. Mr. Chairman, members of the board of this foundation, our learned scholars at the front, my esteemed brothers and sisters, particularly our young boys and our young girls, Assalamu alaikum. It is really heartfelt to see so many of our boys and probably girls on the sister side attending this program. One of the places in society that our youths are in most danger is the home with the father, the mother, and the grandparents around. The home is the most important agent in society. It is called the primary source or the primary level. Primary means more important or most important. If you say something is primary, then it is very, very important. It is a place where you can make the child feel special, important, a very valuable person, a child who can smile, a child who wants to learn about Islam, or it could be a place where you run the child away from Islam. And a place where you make your child depressed. You will be surprised to know how many of our children, with all the cell phones and the remote control gates and the air condition, wants to run away from the house or commit suicide or is doing things to themselves like cutting up their pants or is googling on the simplest, fastest, least painful way to commit suicide. We may never know why do they reach in this position? Why do they want to leave our house? When we put them down, when we make them feel like they are no good, when we call them derogatory names and terms, when we call them foolish, when we tell them they're not bright, we call children daily by this word, you're dumb, you're so foolish. 
when we give preference of one child over the other you are three children but one is feeling no good because you are taking out food from the pot one gets more special food the others you go to the town you buy something you give one you give two and not the other so the child leaves home from that maybe frustrating depressing home where it is either the father is nagging the mother 24 by 7 or the mother is nagging the father 24 by 7 and that is echoing in the child's ear 24 by 7. child comes to the masjid the young boy or the young girl how do we treat them do we criticize them continue to criticize them as some of their parents do do we make them feel special you know about 10 years ago an old imam he's dead now he said jamal when you see a young man or a young girl come to the masjid hug them up hug them up tight kiss them if it's possible and show to them how happy you are that they are here rather than looking for faults with clothes and telling them about this and telling them about that you know you run them away faster than you bring them you have to cause them to like islam first before you tell them about the this and the that and the next last point you listen to some scholars in islam not all you go on the social media and the sermon and the khutbah and the lecture is on hellfire the gender how Allah punishes people the depths of the, the hell punishment in the grave what will happen if you don't do this every single thing is about punishment the young boy or the young girl take out their phone and they are listening to other religion and the leaders of these other religion are preaching their religion in such a manner god loves you nothing negative no set about punishment and punishment and punishment god loves you we welcome you god has created a heaven for you young people and you know this message is gravitating to them i'll tell you this as we speak i interact for the week maybe about 10 15 000 youths some are muslims some are not muslims the most dangerous thing in the muslim environment is where some of our sons and our daughters are putting on the social media and listening to christian how they call them what type of evangelist what type of evangelist the media evangelists, tele evangelists, tele evangelists, and they are listening to them from all over the globe. And when they turn on to the Muslim scholar, not all, some, a whole hour about punishment in the grave, punishment in the hellfire. This is creating a dangerous environment for our youths. We have to get them to love Islam first. But if we preach all of this punishment and punishment and punishment, what we do? We push them away and away into the hands and the clutches of those tele evangelists which are not of Islam. Thank you very much. Jazakallah, um, Dr. Hassim. And I think he had just opened up a whole lot of questions in our minds. So you can note some of these questions. Inshallah, when you, have, when you have the open floor, you can ask some of these questions, Inshallah. Okay, next among the panelists, we have uh, Brother Yazid Imam Din. He has uh, done a lot of um, career guidance in um, with respect to the Ministry of Education, um, dealing with youths, and a secular and social guidance officer. So we'd ask him to address um, the, the aspect of the topic in identifying career pathways as a solution to the dangers that youths are, youths are facing. Right? So, identifying career pathways as a solution to the dangers of youths. What do you see? 
You want the mic or you want? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف المرسلين my dear respected ulama ikram brothers sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم السلام um pertaining pertaining to the topic of identifying pathways in education the solution to the struggle of youths right for a solution um, in terms of opportunities that exist for young people um, that did not exist many years ago. And we know that in society today, that there's a big paradigm shift in terms of the opportunities for study and pursuing of higher level education, which did not exist, which was not um, in existence in the 1960s, 70s, and probably in the 80s. Now we have a whole new broad spec in terms of institutes, um, funding, availability of programs which was never existed before. And the idea is now is that identifying all these things from skills traded into um, what we call social sciences, medical sciences, there are a variety and number of programs which one can attain to. And it all starts with, it all starts at the primary school level and the secondary school level in terms of how parents, parents fashion children minds in terms of to adopt into different career pathways. We hear normally that most parents, they, they have desire, they want their child to become a medical doctor, um, a, a geologist, a, a chemist, a physicist. Um, a teacher, a lawyer, and all these things. But in most cases, when studies are done, in most cases, these are just words. There is no action, there is no justification or push towards a, for the child achieving these types of objectives. And in most cases, from rural areas and stuff, is that what is the percentage of students who actually finish secondary school successfully and moves on to tertiary level studies? And the idea, the, the statistics is alarming to show that even though what is the percentage, and this is not what I am saying, there's a report out that was produced on the, on the CXE results, which came out, I think, in 2016 or 2017. I can't remember exactly here, but it is there on the CXE website. And CXE is saying, the current examination council is saying, that 70% of children who write mathematics O-level exams from Jamaica to Guyana, 70% of them do not know the difference between the area of a, per, of a rectangle and the perimeter of a rectangle. And these are children who are 16 year old, 15 year old, who are writing O-level exams. So the idea is that the quality of education at which one must subscribe to is how it is going to benefit the child in terms of career. And being a good, first of all, before career, we speak about a person being a good Muslim. And is that his education is going to evolve in such a manner, one, if attained successfully by students, by children and so forth, completing degrees and so forth, by attaining these um, qualifications successfully. The question is, sometimes we have seen and we have continued to see that education itself may take a person away from the deen of Islam. And this is a very ticklish subject that pe hardly people want to, to, to embark on or have discussion on. But inshallah tonight we're going to, we will try to, to crack the barrel here to, to uncover what are the, 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 the factors, the quality indicators, how to overcome these obstacles. So inshallah, the whole idea is that educating my child to become a medical doctor, to become an engineer, to become a teacher, a lawyer, etc., etc., etc. Is it, is the education that we are going to give them, is it going to be a, a, a barrier that would avoid them or move them away from Islam? The second thing is that, is, is, is the parents setting up themselves by employing the training to career paths that when the, when the parents reach old age, that the same children who they invested a lot of money, sacrifice, and time for, 
has no has no time because the education and the the, the job they have ta- uh, they have attained through the education which we have given to them. They have no time now to see about the parents when they are in old age. So they push them in a home and etc, etc, etc. So inshallah, tonight we, we, we want to embark on all these things. And the other aspect is that um, in the identif- identification of career paths and opportunities, there are, as I said, there are so many opportunities, there are so many um, career paths which are available and all these things. But identifying these, these, these um, career paths and subscribing to it is one thing. But the, the, the long-term effect is that how it is connected to our Iman and our Deen is the most important, the most important thing. And before I close, the last point, inshallah, there's a whole big study now on, on, on food and education. Is there a correlation between food and education? And last year, November, I was in a, a, a conference in the United States. And it's strange enough that most educationists in the United States now are saying that our children now have a new shape. Our children, body, physique has a new shape. The, the new shape of the future is called the apple shape body now. So it's not about apple shape, apple using laptops and the brand, but it's about the physical shape of the human being now is being redefined as an apple shape. The suit to be compatible with the type of food we are eating. And as there was, there was a, a um, I was also in, 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 in another country too, where they was doing um, a whole series on food they were eating. And it was so, it was so alarming to know that this very set type of food we are feeding our children, cereals and all these things, these are the food that is causing direct dis, dis, um, learning disorders on our own children. So sometimes the, the approach now is how, how a Muslim must position themselves to function in society and not be absorbed in society, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah. So Jazakallah to Brother Yazid, he, had, he identified some areas of careers and he raised a very important point with respect to his education, taking our youths away from Dean. Keep that, inshallah, we will discuss that further. Um, the last of the panelists um, on the table here, we have Mufti Abdurrahman, and he will be highlighting some of the Islamic solutions to this problem that we are seeing around us. Mufti, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa atba'ihi al-humati al-deen al أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله نبي الكريم I would like to first take this opportunity to apologize on behalf of my teacher Sheikh Fadil he was not able to make it today's function. He was supposed to come and do this, what I am doing here. He has placed his confidence in me to try to fill his shoes, and I will do my best for that, inshallah. This verse which I have recited from the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Today I have perfected for you your religion, your deen, and I have completed my favors upon you, and I am pleased that Islam is your deen. In Islam, there is a solution to all of our problems. This is what we believe. This is one of our tenets of faith. All of the problems that exist in society, whether it be inside of our homes, inside of our masajid, in our schools, in our workplaces, Islam has a solution for it. However, sometimes, and this is more often than not, we do not know what Islam says is the solution to our problems. So for example, my brother here, he was talking about the most dangerous place is the home. Islam speaks about the home. Islam speaks about how a man should choose his spouse. This goes way beyond, way back to when, before we had children. Islam speaks about how a person should choose their spouse. Malana Sean was talking about the identity of of a person. Islam speaks about what is the identity of a Muslim and how a person should choose their identity. 
or develop that identity? And how does it come about that a person will call himself a Muslim? Islam has the solution for that. But my dear respected listeners, brothers and sisters, the only way we will be able to practice upon what Islam sees, because we already believe that Islam is complete and Islam has a solution for everything. The only way that we can practice what Islam sees, this messenger that we see that we love, the only way that we can, we can practice what he sees is by seeking Islamic knowledge. Learning what Allah and his messenger has said about the different problems that we have. So hopefully today, inshallah, we will all be able to find some of these solutions together. Hopefully, inshallah. But Islam already have the answers. Sometimes we know them and sometimes we don't. We may have to do some more research to find some answers. And some answers are open for us. So for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that Jannat lies at the feet of your mother. Where does your mother's feet be? In the home. And this Jannah that we are talking about, this paradise, it is at her feet. And it so happens that her feet is in the home. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that to seek knowledge is compulsory upon every mu'min. That knowledge is not quantified as Islamic knowledge. That is all knowledge. In order for a person to live a correct life, a complete Islamic life, they must know all the different sciences that are necessary to be known. They must know how to live a healthy life. They must know how to, how to eat healthy foods. They must know about exercise. They must know about all the different things that are necessary to be known falls under this word of ilm or knowledge. And after we receive that ilm, we must make amal upon it. We must do the actions that we have learned which is correct. So these are just a few words inshallah. I hope that we will be able to answer as many questions today inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana anil hamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khair. I'm Mufti Abdurrahman. And as believers, we all believe that Islam is the solution and that's the point that is reiterated all the time. But yet we see many of our Muslim youths are still going astray. We see that they are, they are succumbing to the dangers that surround them. Okay, so inshallah this is something that we would deal with as we go along. Um, I would like to just some general thanks to all of the brothers who would have given a contribution. And before we proceed further, just uh, explain to you all the, the, the rest of the program and to give some general guidelines with respect to the question. As believers, we are disciplined. And uh, being disciplined means that we, we follow and adhere to certain guidelines. So even for the panel discussion, there has to be certain guidelines in the way we ask questions, in the way we address people as well. So there will be questions from both males and the females. The males, mashallah, we have um, a mic system set up there. Those who want, they can come and ask a question, of course. We'll see you and then we'll usher you to start. Um, mashallah, one of our brothers will pass around as well. Those who are a bit shy and don't want to come up to the mic, that um, we would have the brother pass around and he can ask from where he is. Of course, be clear in your questioning. Um, the sisters, there is a designated sister on the sister side. You can go to her and she would WhatsApp the question to someone from here and then we will get the question. We will pass it on you know, to the panel inshallah for discussion. Um, some ground rules for asking questions. First of all, we are asking you all to stick to the topic. The topic tonight is danger surrounding the youth. So don't go and talk, ask about a masala of salah or about hajj or some other thing of that nature. Let's stick to the topic at hand, inshallah. Okay? Secondly, we need to respect the panelists, even though we may not fully support their views. They are our guests, and we expect as believers that we respect each other, even though there may be some differences. Okay, so if you have to address something that has been said, address it in a proper manner. Um, we would also like that you all respect each other. A person might make a comment, or say something, or ask a question. We do not expect you to rebut against that. If you have your concern, you ask your question. 
inshallah um try not to be too personal when asking a question do not say i have a son i need to do this and this and the next or my daughter she run away with this person and this kind of problem that we have don't be personal but ask about the concern because here you're opening up your your personal life to others okay so ask about the situation we would ask you to refrain from calling anyone's name okay or business or institutions please avoid doing that let's respect others deal with the issue at hand also you know i am here as the, the as the moderator of the program if it is that sometimes a person may be talking too much or asking a question and becoming a bayan then i would have to step in please respect the authority that you know bdf has given to me and i'm sitting here as your humble um, moderator to try to guide the process of the program inshallah okay um question should be directed to the moderator or if it pertains to a particular comment that person make we can indicate towards that but generally you address the question to the moderator and we will direct who, is, who should answer it inshallah um we will request that try to make your questions within a minute okay and not be not not beyond that so you know with these few guidelines you know we want to welcome any questions or concerns that you all have so by the time you all organizing and trying to think about questions i would like to you know throw out some questions for some of our um, panelists and the first thing is you know the, the topic at hand here is dangers surrounding youth how do we define youth because i mean this is my beard getting gray but i still feel i am a youth from a technical or professional point how do we define youth dr hasim from a academic perspective youth is defined as someone between the ages of 0 and 19 there are some hadiths of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which differs from this biological perspective and might go beyond that age you know 20 25 26 in some social settings they say youth is as young as you feel so the definition for it if you look at it from a social perspective if you look at it from a biological perspective and maybe from an islamic perspective they all vary exactly. but maulana you are a youth <laughs> alhamdulillah you see so that has been endorsed <laughs> so it is as young as you feel and mashallah we have a lot of youths amongst us so that means to say the topic is pertinent to all of us okay um another thing which is in the topic in itself is dangers now we, we identify certain aspects of dangers as being um physical emotional psychological cultural spiritual social i want to ask uh, the panelists here openly if they want to add anything to, to that but is it you want to add anything to that you could be done enough. Um, <coughs> besides, besides the normal, um, the normal dangers which uh, youths are, are exposed to in terms of the te technological, social media, the, the apparent, um, what we call readiness and availability of technical devices and access to information, access to communication with other people in different parts of the world. I think one of the most one of the most important um, factor which is directly affecting youths both and it is affecting them physically um, emotionally and it is it is directly impacting on impacting on their performance in in all aspects of life even education is that aspect of what the youth consumes and and there are many studies by different universities now which are directly targeting this core issue which in, in, there's a clear direct link between what someone consumes especially the adolescents and what and how they behave and behaving behaviorism in terms not only in physical behavior but how they think how they respond to certain remarks and all these things are patterned in a certain um, what you call a category of, of, of disturbance 
that it is now triggering other effects of, of misbehavior in, 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 in public um, spaces and all these things, and co- parenting control and all these things. So, 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 so that's a, a, a point that probably we can probably summarize as you become what you eat, is that so? Yes, exactly, and it is proven now because we, we see here in Trinidad what, what is the ratio, um, probably not here in Marco so much, but um, on the out, on, on San Fernando and Marble and all these areas, Gasper Road, the, these areas are so close, Kirk, and there's a minute, two minute drive uh, away from each other. But yet, look of the ratio of fast food outlets that exist in these areas. Let's, let's take, for example, the San Fernando area, Marble at Gasper Road, San Fernando. How many fast food outlets are there? So the thing about it, the, the pricing strategy is working for them, the brand is working for them, the taste, the taste is working for them, the financial profits is working for them, and we have seen how much money Pristine's holdings alone have made last year, last financial year. Avoid, avoid calling. Sorry, yeah. delete that. But how much money these brand, these franchise holders are making? Yeah. Nearly close to a billion dollars, and who? And in a small population of 1.4 million people, they are generating large sums of profits. So, but who, but the ripple effect is that the only effect that the consumers get is what the bad effect. Okay, so so the thing about this is that food and health become a danger that is surrounding our youth. You want to agree with that? Yourself? From a from a um, Islamic standpoint, you know we believe that you know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sustains us. Okay, and as such, if it is that. A person, it, 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 from the aspect of father, we say that whatever is written for a person, he will consume. So how do you contrast that statement that um, Brother Yazid have mentioned? It is true that whatever a person is written in their life, they will consume. But they don't have to consume it all at once. And maybe a person could consume a lot, but then what about the other aspects of life? What? What about the other aspects of health, which are exercise, rest, and all these other things? These are all part of a person's life, and life is a complete thing. It's not just only about what a person consumes. It must be in con- because a person could eat the thing that Brother Yazid is talking about from that particular company, and he could go and play for he or she could could um, exercise off those extra calories. So the the uh, I think that um, brother Yazid the, the 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 paradigm he gave with respect to the shape of you today is turning into an apple shape. It is not just about what um, what they consume, but their but our sedentary lifestyle ha- ha- has to do something with that too as well. I mean, how many of us here walked to this program today who are living within walking distance? Um, I came from, from, from Kunupia, so I drove. But 50 years ago, someone who was coming from Kunupia to Barapur may not have driven. They may have walked some of the way, traveled some of the way, and run some of the way, possibly. I don't know. I wasn't here 50 years ago. But the point is, is that our lives have changed, and we as Muslims must change with that. Islam does not change. Islam was here 1,400 years ago. And Islam is still here now. And Islam has the solution for all of these things. Islam could, tells us. Could we, could we also add to that that, you know, Allah has given us choices. And we make choice of what we consume. Right. Isn't that so? Mm-hmm. Okay, um, another aspect that, you know, you spoke about life, lifestyle and so on. And I'm sure this is a problem that everyone faces. With respect to, well, I'm speaking our parents. Children probably don't see it as a problem. And that is the amount of electronic games and um, technology, how it affects youth today, and um, the, the psychological effect and influence it has on youth. Um, Mona Sean, you, 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 you've been in, um, involved with a lot of, of youths and so on on the ground. What basically you, 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 you would find um, um, in your dealing with youth as the problem itself? Jazakallah khair. Now, first, first of all, I would like to say is that each and every one of us today, we look at our technology, our means of communication as something as important. Actually, 
our cell phones, our laptops, our communication devices have become a part of us. It is inseparable. We cannot even walk without it. And in so doing, in reality, it has become an addiction. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even told us that, mashallah, you know, you should, you can in, involve in stuff, but he says, hubbuka shay'a yu'mi wa yusum. That your love for something makes you blind and it makes you deaf. And sometimes as youths, sometimes as, and when we say youth, as our brother rightly said, that youthful age is as young as you feel, because even the older people, the adults, the parents, sometimes you see them. And, you know, I was, I was listening to one lecturer and he was saying a very important thing. He says that we should stop looking down at the cell phone and look up at our future. Because that little cell phone is what is our destruction. Because we do not know how to use it. We do not know how to benefit from it. A cell phone is very beneficial. This little device, this little gadget is very beneficial. But it is how we utilize it. So how do we strike the balance between allowing our children to use cell phones and um, restricting them at the same time? First of all, I think as any parent, we should not just go with what society say. Now, normally we will give our children a cell phone, but we should be the ones who are monitoring what is on that cell phone. As a parent, it should never ever happen that we give our cell phone because our neighbor children have a cell phone. No. No, but could that not be, if you look at it from a different aspect, a child may think, looking at it from the, the eye of a child, mm. you know, my parent, my guardian, they are restricting my freedom. This is my freedom. I could, I could, I, I, I should have a, a, a cell phone. And most of them, most, most children, especially youths, teenagers, into young adults, this would be their comment that, you know, why are you restricting my freedom? Um, one of the things I think that they should be, as parents, we should be able to dialogue with our children. We should be able to speak to our children, show them the harms of things. Everything has its benefit and everything has its harms. And as parents, we should be able to show our children the harms of things. And I will give you an example. As a parent, let's say, for instance, you have given your child a cell phone. There is no time where that child should have such password which you cannot access. So it should be a mutual understanding, a mutual trust. I have trust you as a child to give you a cell phone. Then I mu you must also trust me that I will not dig up and whatever. But at the same time, you will not go beyond what I, the stipulations or the guidelines I have given to you. And what I'm sp speaking about um, is sometimes, I actually, there was an incident where a child was given a cell phone and she was communicating with an adult. And we see it many times. And there are so many videos whereby she was communicating with an adult. <laughs> The person impersonated a youngster. So this girl, she was about 13 or 14 years, right? And what was happening is that this person invited her to a dinner or something. And she lied to her parents and she left and she was murdered. It even happened in Trinidad here with big people. It is happening. So I think as a parent, you should be able to show your children the dangers. Restrict, give them a cell phone, but there must be some restriction. It must not be total freedom. Okay, so, so that's... So that's a, an important point. How do we then um, show our children that? Um, Dr. Asim, you have been in, in the forefront. Um, show them uh, the aspect of the dangers of the cell phone. Show them how the cell phone has influenced them. Or do you agree with that point altogether? Yeah, to show children the dangers of the cell phone is one thing. Or technology on the whole. Yeah. For they to listen to you is another. You could show all you want, but they're not listening. They will listen to you while you're there, and as they leave and they go to their room is another. The relationship you have with your child, the relationship is very, very important. Relationship means what? That when you talk, your child will just not listen, but they will listen to understand and to understand the dangers of what lies in here. That could only come about when you trust them and they trust you, which is a very difficult place to reach today compared to 30 years ago 
of 40 years ago. So everything has to do with the relationship you have with your children. There are some nine-year-olds who will not tell their parents anything. There are some 16-year-old girls who will go and tell their mommy everything. So how much your children believe in what you say and agrees in what you say has to do with the relationship you have with your children. So that aspect of trust, what you're saying there, that trust and that relationship is not just only a solution for the cell phone and the internet. There's a solution and the for computer, many other things. Many other problems Meeting boyfriend, persist. girlfriend in primary school, secondary school. What do they do after school? What do they do during school? They're quick to come and tell mommy and daddy because there is a relationship. But if there isn't any relationship, you have a child living in your house and you don't know the child. The child is living a completely separate life under your roof. Everybody knows what's going on with a child except you. You're the last one to hear and you're the last one to know what a bad place to be. Jazakallah. Um, probably before the program finishes, we would like to get an input on how do we develop that trust? Because you identify that as being a solution. Okay. Um, we have a question on the floor. Mashallah. One better. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum Sir, um, we have a question here. Um, what if you, your, ch your child is dating a non-Muslim, you know, and all that the parent tried to stop the child you know, talk to the child, he's not getting through at all. What we could do about our problem? So we have two problems there. One is the dating of a non-Muslim. Dating in itself is an issue. Dating a non-Muslim. And the third issue is um, the parents not getting through. Um, who want to tackle that? <laughs> sure. I can try. Um, but has he tried something? So, first of all, Brother Hassim has already answered this question actually. It is really about the relationship we have with our children. And when you say child, obviously this wouldn't be a, a 10 year old child. This might be someone who is already maybe has a career and they are working in the outside world so they are interacting with with um people who they could have a relationship with a a, a boyfriend girlfriend relationship so the core of this goes back to the home in which this person grew up what values were given to that person what did they take from what was given because as Brother Hassim is saying, you could tell them, but will they listen? So, we, we are talking about here the trust that develops between parents and their children, and how to develop that trust. And in Islam, we have learned from the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we always hear the stories about when alcohol was made haram, the streets flowed with alcohol. What do you... What do you learn from this story? You know what I learned? The Sahabas had real alcohol in the house. So they used to drink alcohol. For the streets to flow with it means to say they all had it and it was plentiful. But what happened when the rule was given? It flew. And we learn from Sirah that that only happened because the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een with the Messenger of Allah spent years working on taqwa. So there was a period of conditioning the mind, so to say. And that is the period of the home. That is why Jannat is at the feet of the mother. Because at the home is where we will build the love of Allah, the love of the Messenger of Allah and taqwa. And these things will create a barrier towards disobedience of Allah. If a person loves Allah, he loves the Messenger of Allah, every single question that comes to his mind, every single act that he, is, he or she is about to do, 
he will be thinking to himself, I wonder if Allah wants this from me. Okay, so, so that's a very important point. We need to develop that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the question was asking that if this dating of a non-Muslim person is taking place, how or what is the next step in dealing with the problem? Because it's a problem. So as a parent, you have to remember your children in your duels. You have to talk to them. And you, that's basically all that you could do at that point in time. Because the horse has already bolted. Okay, so now looking at any perspective of our topic. So then we are saying that the influence of peers, the influence of friends is a danger for our youths. And it all depends who our children befriend, who our children line with, who they go and play with at times. Okay? Um, Brother Yazid, if you can probably elaborate on that aspect of the influence of friends as uh, determining pathways for um, children. But the idea with, the idea with, uh, with, with peer, peer pressure is one of the things that is a big influence with, with among adolescents, teenagers, and even primary school, even primary school um, students. Um, but the, 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 the fact is now, the, the communication aspect where, where students can converse with one another is not like long time in the 80s and in the, in the 70s. It is actually at the fingertips. Everybody wants to happen, Instagram, this, that, etc., etc. And there's so much to be added to that. So the whole, the whole aspect of communication, and now there's another, there's another um, dimension of pressure which are added to social media to, to, to students among themselves. Is that you speak now not just children but adults, adults and, and teenagers? Exactly. Who can post the most pictures on Facebook? After the Easter weekend where they went, who went a better place, who went out of the country, who went South Park more than who, and all these things. And there's an internal, an internal competition among young people in terms of, in terms of accessing places, going away, this, that, etc., etc. And you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and the competition among themselves is who could put up four small pics, as I say. And who could do this and show off in a sense? And it's a, it's a, it was a, 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 something that never existed before. A long time was just when cell phone, re, before cell phone reached it, reach it, it current state. Which um, before, was a long time when had the, the Me Too, only you could only voice call and text. Um, back in the, in, the, in the early 2000s and stuff. Before we have touch screen cell phones and things. So there was a limitation on communication. But now, even though cell phone was a technology 20 years ago in Trinidad, now the limitations of technology has, 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 has overspilled in a, in a whole new dimension now. Well, live chats is, is, is like, long time when, you, when, when people hear about live chats 15 years ago, that was something that a, a 50 year old at that time was, I say, what is that? Nowadays, that is something which is like eating cricks in the morning. So those things actually influence that, that Creates the danger. Create the danger. So when we feel that because our children are not exposed to our place physically, that that is an idea which has gone out the window now. A student could go on Google Map, a person could stay home in the house and go on Google Maps or whatever and look at another country and this and that. There are certain programs, I think it's Instagram, where people could actually follow you to know where you are live on real time. Okay, right? so, so that, that's, that's an important point with respect to the technology part, right? And now, but, but a short, more than a short, raise an important point. Yeah. Where actually through social media, in, there's a woman, for example, one case I can remember clearly through Facebook, meet some guy and whatever, and she went, she was from Siparia, and she went to Maracas Beach to meet the guy, and she was murdered. I think that was one of the cases recently in Trinidad. So, all right, so, so coming back to the, to the topic at hand, right? Um, with respect to the, the dating of the non-Muslim, I want to just get Mola Sean input into that, inshallah. Okay, so. so, Alhamdulillah, you know, what Mufti Abdurrahman and the others, other panelists have mentioned, Alhamdulillah, it is what is pro being proactive before these things happen. So the scenario that they would have explained to us having relationship with your children, you know, making dua. These are what is, if before it happens, this is what we should be doing. But here it is, we have a case which is done already. Your daughter, your 16-year-old daughter, your 17-year-old daughter, 
she is now having, she's dating a non-Muslim. How would you deal with that? The first thing that you must recognize is what the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. He says, حُبُّكَ شَيْئَ يُعْمِي وَيُسُنُ That your love for something will make you deaf and blind. So no matter what you try to tell that 16-year-old girl, whatever you try to put before her, or even a boy, it is not going to make any sense. So the first thing you should try to establish, you have to do what is known as damage control. That is what you have to go and do now. So the first thing you should look at, who is more influential in this person's life in speaking to that individual? Who they will listen to, who they respect. It may be an uncle, it may be an imam, it may be an alim, it may be a counselor. Look for that individual. That's the first thing. Secondly, as a parent, try the technique of inviting that same non-Muslim boy or that same non-Muslim girl, bring them home. I want to meet them. But before doing that, pose certain question to your child. Do you want this person to be your husband in the future? Do you, because obviously, based on your home, you're supposed to have Islamic values. So ask your children simple questions. Do you want that your children be brought up as non-Muslims? What type of family do you want? Would their family accept you as a Muslim? Start to pose these questions. Let, they, let them answer the questions for themselves. You don't answer it for them. Because they have the intelligence to their smart. Now, in doing that, invite the person home and try to convince him or her to accept Islam. And who knows? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might be this a means for which that person may accept Islam and become a practical Muslim. And here it is, you can have a son-in-law or a daughter-in-law who could become a practical Muslim. So this is what is known as damage control. Right? Jazakallah. Okay, um, there's a question on the floor again. Thanks, brother. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Alaikum salam. Um, Mufisab, uh, I have a question. I'm, I'm trying to keep with the guidelines, inshallah, but it is not just a one line or one sentence question. I'll come to that in the, uh, at the end, inshallah. I'll um, try to make it brief, inshallah, and three point. Okay. My question is what are we, the Muslims in Trinidad, doing about not the problem but the epidemic of drug addiction? So I don't want to say this. Alhamdulillah, we have an abundance of massages. We have musallas, we have abundance of ulama, abundance of madrasas, and a whole lot of things going on, alhamdulillah. My question is, why do we not have a drug rehabilitation center for Muslims run by Muslims, like the other denominations do? Because this is a problem that is not going away. It is real, and it is affecting us all. Well, definitely, the, the whole issue of drug addiction, it is a danger, not just only for non-Muslim, but only, but as well as for Muslims. And as such, what you are suggesting here of having uh, like an Islamic drug rehabilitation center, I'm not too sure if it exists already, but it is a good proposal. It is something that, you know, mashallah, um, uh, counseling, um, in, you know, like, 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 like for instance, I mean, is it, uh, from my knowledge, BDF, we intend to have some sort of a counseling to help in that regard. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure in the different quarters, in different massages, in different places, there will be some sort of a counseling that help mitigate against that and assist. But to go to the full-fledged drug rehabilitation center, mashallah, it's a good proposal. I'm, I don't know if anyone want to add to that, if they know of any sort of an institution that exists that probably um, uh, focuses mainly on Muslims. Anyone? Uh, Dr. Hassim, you know any of, of such? No. So it is it's something that you probably have started the discussion on it. Okay? Mufti up there, I want to say something. Yeah. We have some. There is um, an organization called the Islamic Medical Facilities Foundation that was recently founded and um, they are in the process of trying to set up an Islamic drug rehabilitation center. So it is coming inshallah and of course these kind of things require funding. So, inshallah, when it comes, we hope to have it helped, inshallah. Mashallah, you know, whenever we see something of um, uh, benefit for the Muslim community, we should support it in whatever we can. Mullah Sean? Yeah. Um, 
Actually, in North Trinidad, there are two brothers who they do this work, drug rehabilitation. But they, because of, as Mufti Abdul Rahman mentioned, the finance, they don't have anything organized. But if it is that you know anyone who wants that help, you can contact me and I can put you on to them, inshallah. Okay, mashallah. So there's a, a door open there. Alhamdulillah. And Mola Sean is a conduit towards it. <laughs> I'll accept. Um, there's another question, Mola Manan. Yes, yeah, Salaam Alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa Sister, for, on the lady's side, there's a question that comes across to us here. And the question is, the youths today are pushed or driven to find a career once they turn 18 years. They can provide for themselves. So how can education be a barrier for me or for that individual in Islam? Okay, so I think that is a follow-up to a statement that was made by Brother Yazid. So I'll throw that on you. Basically, what, what, what you're looking at is um, sisters, but not just only sisters. I think that's, that it is more general than that. That way, how could education be a barrier to what was mentioned? To Islam. To Islam. Islam yes. Oh, right. <clears throat> so the question is, how could Islam be a barrier? Uh, education. Sorry, sorry. How could education be a barrier towards Islam? Yes. <clears throat> Normally, traditionally, we could look we could look at it from two points. Normally, when a person goes to school from primary school onto secondary school, a child is taught from long ago to go to school, study hard, get a good job, X Y Z, right? So, so you can get a, earn a, live a good standard of of, of life. Get a high, live a high standard of living, a better quality of life, etc. But that the, history has shown us that these things are just words. Go to school, get an education, get a good job, etc., etc. And you'll buy a car, you'll build a house, you have a family, and that's life. What data has shown? Right from different surveys by different universities and so forth, is that going to a student attaining tertiary education itself for most students who are sometimes studying part time, working full time, and have their family is a challenge itself. Yeah. Right. This is why although gate free tertiary education was was something which was of a good by nature. In Trinidad, when, when it was established in 2004, but w what was the effects of that free ed tertiary education? Is, is, did that directly through education, by having a more, a more educated society, did that decrease the murder rates in Trinidad? Right? For, for example, that's for discussion purposes, did that dec decrease? Did it help the people on the East West Corridor? To alleviate out of poverty, people in South Trinidad. The idea is that although tertiary education was free, which was a good thing, also what was not planned for was the dropout rate, the retention rate was also high. Okay, just want to just want to keep focus on the question, right? Yeah. You're speaking about a Muslim. You are saying that if this Muslim child furthers his education, perhaps the a bachelor's or master's or PhD. We are saying that that can be a barrier yeah, or that can prevent that person from practicing right. his din. Th thanks. You, thanks. You, you want to keep focusing on the point? Thanks for the I tend to, I tend to derail a lot, you know. But, um, you're right. <clears throat> so, going back to the question, is that the person obtains a degree. The first thing he wants is a good job. Right? A good job. And, in, in, and by extension, the nature of the job that he or she may attain may be demanding. Long hours, working overtime, all these things, especially the field involved in the medical field or IT, as the case may be. When a person gets that job and the job itself becomes so demanding and, and then they have other responsibilities like their family, this, etc. The question is, what do they deserve to put aside and they focus on? The first things a, per a person he or she put aside or they deserve is their Islam and Deen. There are some cases where I see university graduates that they are so absorbed in their work, they are making so much of money, yes, but at the same time, they do not even know when is Ramadan. And this is the level of Iman, the fluctuation of their deen. That it also, by attaining academic qualification, 
it absorbs one in the, the, in, into a career that is so time consuming that if they have to deshelve something or put something aside, the first thing they will compromise on is the Islam. So and should there be a balance then? So the, the idea for a Muslim first is that before we begin any studies, we should ask ourselves, and we learn this, am I going to do study for the Kidmat of Deen? How many people ask ourselves, am I going to study for the Kidmat of Deen? Am I going to come back, go and change society? Or is it a focus on myself, I first? So the whole aspect is that, the, and, and if the camera is, is, is pushing out, there must be a holistic approach in terms of the career pathways that a Muslim, especially a Muslim, is undertaking. Because you could be a Muslim by name. However, there is no Muslim in your in your outer body and in your inner body as well too. Okay, Jazakallah. Um, uh, Dr. Hassim, he wants uh, to add to something to that, inshallah. Yes, we can. The books that I use at secondary level, secondary school level, and at university level, the authors of these books are all enemies to Islam. When you begin your degree, degrees are based on theories. And you have to learn the theories in order to pass an examination. So you learn a number of theories at bachelor's level. When you go up at master's level, you learn more theories. And the depth at which you study these theories, there is a tendency for the individual to begin to believe in these theories, particularly if they want to be a practitioner, you know, to open a private practice, they are required to use these theories to help people, like theories in psychology, sociology, social work. So these are the tools. You cannot put the tool here and use something else. The tool is part of your profession. So you believe in it. And if you believe in those theories, 99.99% .99 of all theories, and I'll be giving this lecture, I think, in Mon Montrose sometime next month, how academic knowledge causes youths to deviate from Islam. 99, I've spent 12 long years at the University of the West Indies, and I have not seen a Muslim theorist, a Muslim scholar, who have written any of those thousands of books that exist. 99.9% .9 of all theorists who develop theories that people study when they go to university are developed by non-Muslims. 100% of the books, and here what the university will tell you which book to study. Chicago and want to study water, and then study books about geology. You have to study the prescribed books. So the books are written by non-Muslims. The books themselves are based on theories that are against Islam. For example, whether you do social science, natural science, or whatever type of science, they believe in the manner in which the earth evolved, which is totally against Islam. Darwin theory about the Big Bang, Islam says something else. And the Big Bang theory starts from primary school, secondary school, go up to, go up to where? University. So the way the university in Trinidad and nearly throughout the world is organized, it carries the child away from Islam for the years that they have studied. Dr. Hassan, I just want to yeah. show you something there. Looking from a practical point of view, um, a student would have finished primary, secondary, they got their subjects and so on, but then they have a career in mind because at the end of the day, you want a good job, have a good salary, and with that, you'll move on to probably build a house, get a car, whatever, marry, settle down. The, but but the point the point is that um, uh, in order to achieve that 
in the workplace, you need some sort of a professional qualification. So how then do we make a balance between going through those system, the, the system and at the same time keeping and maintaining our Islam? Because we are recognizing now that those academic things can be a danger for our youth. It's an attraction. It is drawing them. So you can probably address that, inshallah. My view might be unconventional. The whole notion of a good job, a pretty car, a nice house is an American wish, not an Islamic one. And we imbuild that in our children. Good job, big house, this big house, pretty car, degree does not warrant your happiness. As a um, practitioner, I will tell you this in my song, Very Harsh, my own experience in dealing with people, some of the most depressed, confused, frustrated minds are those educated ones with a pretty car and a pretty house. It brings me back to the question, my son is here, one of them, and the other one is here, I saw him just now. Back then, this this institution was a school for boys and they were offering the HIFS course when my son was 14. He said, Dad, I want to stop school. I said, what do you want to do? He is in the back, half his fatty. He said, Dad, I want to become a half his. When my father and sister and brother heard a 14-year-old wants to leave, a secondary school, they wanted to cut off my neck up till today. He came here and Alhamdulillah some two years ago, he graduated as a half is and he is teaching. And to me, to me, the boy looked happier than me. With all the qualification academically and all this, because the Islamic knowledge and what he has and Islam brings more Islamic knowledge brings more happiness than, um, than, than academic knowledge. Do not underestimate the taxi driver. Do not underestimate the man who is planting pine. Do not underestimate the young woman who says she wants to go and sew clothes for the sisters and they will pay her to do so. That brings happiness too. The definition of happiness, that happiness comes only from house, land, car, is an American ideology and I was telling you all about theories and books that whole thing they call it a Hollywood Hollywood dream of a pretty car and house and you know the Bollywood mansion that is not an Islamic dream Allahu Akbar so mashallah um, Dr. Hassim has given us a very in-depth discussion we thank both um, Brother Yazid and Dr. Hassim for their input in that aspect you know, at the same time, it is not discouraging anyone from educating themselves or parents from educating their children. But remember, at the same time, we need to do our father's parents. Guide, teach, ensure that they enroll in a maktab, ensure that they go to classes, ensure that their value for deen is more than any other value. And in that way, we'll keep them on, on track, the skills or whatever can be an asset for them in this in this world and it can help in the propagation of the at the same time you, you want to add something yes, so add short, one, eh? yeah. one thing very short um <clears throat> pertaining to what we talk about education and happiness and that kind of thing um <clears throat> that's a f to further add is that only in islam only in islam one can find peace because you root word of islam you know islam is peace and it's only when someone, although we possess all these high level tertiary qualification, we could even be a good electrician, etc., etc. But once someone, as a Muslim, does not focus on deen and practice deen as how it should be and educate themselves Islamically, they will never find peace. And to show an example of that, before I close, um, if we look in, 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 in Europe, in Norway and Sweden, the standard of living is so high, very high. And um, like Stockholm, in, in Sweden, Stockholm have the, 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 the big institute of finance and all these things. And, but the, one of the things is that although the standard of living and the quality of life is perceived to be so high, it is alarming to know 
it is alarming to know that they also have a very high suicidal rate. So there's a big gap. There's a big gap between education, wealth, and life. Because people are taking their lives, people are on drugs. Even in Norway, the, con the government are institutionalizing the free exchange of sort needles for people to take drugs, to control the spread of STDs and all these things. So they are sort of supporting these things because people are not happy. Why would someone take their life? Why would someone go on drugs? Inshallah, Tala. So the aspect of our deen and our Islamic knowledge bringing peace to us, I think that is the cap over the whole discussion. And um, we can get true peace through our deen, through Islam. Now there's a question from Ola Malan. On uh, move the, the lady side, side again. again. I would like to pose a question before we move on. Probably the uh, let's ask an after we we'll, yeah. uh, just some of the ladies I just under the centers. Problems facing Muslim girls. Should teen Muslim girls be allowed to wear makeup? Everywhere you look, the faces of Muslim youth girls are covered with makeup. How should you advise teenage daughters on this topic when they come and they tell you all their friends are using makeup? That's just part of the question that just for a second to add it. Are we providing sufficient halal opportunities for our youths to not feel left out in society? Okay, so those two things, um, just take note of it. We'll discuss in a while. Um, Mufti Abdurrahman, you want to add something? Shall so, as, as we are having a panel discussion and you all are asking us all of these questions, I have a question to pose. Brother Hassim, he just made a statement that. The, the, the dream of having a house, a land and a car and a wife or wives or whatever it is. This is not an Islamic dream. What is the Islamic dream? What is the dream of a person who considers themselves a Muslim? That is something that you have to have inside of you. Every person, every Muslim has to have that. Every person has to have that that is controlled, of course, by the laws of Islam, by Allah and His Messenger. And it is different for every person. So what okay. is your dream? Okay. That Mashallah. is just something for you to think about. So think about it. Um, Allah has guided us basically in the Quran. You all can think about it. Whosoever has been entered into the Jannah and have been saved from the fire, they are indeed successful. Okay, so we have a brother in the back there. Ask the question. You still have to hear from the sisters to answer. Yeah. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. I have listened to all of you. From this paper here, I can see that you all have a level of education. That is all present. Um, None of you has spoken on the meat of the matter. None of you. Um, Let me explain. Let me explain. You see, no, no. I was part of the consultation okay. on the education reform that took place in this country. Um, and I posed some questions to the panel. People, this degree, the other degree, none of them could have answered. I will not pose the same question to you all, but from an Islamic viewpoint, I will pose some questions to you all. All of us know the story of Robinson Crusoe. Um, but I, I'm I just, a point here. Just, I am making a valid point here. Yeah, he was shipwrecked in an island. Just, just, and what the Englishman told him that he could go to South Africa and bring some slaves, and his his farm, his business would progress. But what they did not tell him, but they did not tell him, the danger. He not he not sure to reach back alive in his plantation. So we look at one one aspect of things. I'm not looking at other aspect of it. Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, well-known psychologist, when he gave his very first maiden speech to an English audience, the people get up and say, this man is mad. Today, the works and contribution of Sigmund Freud is being studied in over 50 languages and countries in the world. I don't say in history, give me much more than that. And Sigmund Freud is the opening state. He, this is what he's saying. When children in our community, in our society, in nation, grow up 
to be un become of the society and nation. In other words, they go up to be thieves and drugs and, and all, any other thing that we didn't want. We, as elders, educators, parents, we are the failures. We have failed. We have failed. So, can you refer in, in, in well, a I, question, I please? We're looking at time to Inshallah. We'll I'll appreciate that. Point. Yeah. The brother next to you said Islam have a problem, so a solution to all the problems. So is it that we don't know Islam? How can we say Islam have a solution to all problems? How can we still have so much of problems? The bottom line is, since you want to cut me off, the bottom line is, is education. If you ask a classroom of 100 would-be mothers, which is the most important period in pregnancy, figure one correct answer, you get the correct answer. As parents, as teachers, as educators, most of us, we are the failures. And I'll tell you how we are failures. We cannot talk. Most of the time, we cannot talk and say the right thing. And that's what Allah said, when you speak, speak the truth. Who shall have Iman shall have Iman, and who shall be unbeliever shall be. You know what is the problem? We cannot speak the truth. Because we tell you what this one will say, what the next one will say. We might I'm, be getting other stipend somewhere. We might lose all that. We cannot speak the truth. But I, sorry, I, I don't want to. I don't understand. I want to cut you across or anything like that. But, you are but, me but we cannot. We, we sort of give some guidelines that you should probably ask a question within a minute. But what is your question? Excuse. I think I'm yeah. a little bit off course here, Mufti Kaya. Yeah. We need. We need to. We, we need to. We need to. We need to focus on the topic, conclude, please. I will conclude at this point. Huh? We know all the problems. What structure we are putting in place? Okay. As, as teachers, as educators, what structure, what um, mechanism are we putting in place? So your question is, what structure do we have? We at the whole for what? Place? How are we to deal with the youth? Okay. What structure do we have in place to deal with what? The dangers of the youth? Problems and problematic youth. Problems we have with the youth. Okay. Inshallah, Jazakallah. So, 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 you know, we appreciate, um, mashallah, your question. We had, we had discussed that, what's shocked here. And, um, we want to move on to, we have some other discussion. We have some other questions to deal with. So, Jazakallah for, for, for your little input there. Um, as I said, it's not about cutting off you. We are working with time to at the same time. We do appreciate that. You have asked a question. So, um, uh, but I see, do you want to address that? Yeah. What structure do we have structure. in dealing with, with the problem that's faced by the youth? The, the, the first question, the first question I will ask is that, we in 2018, Kirk, what is the level of Islamic education from 20, from 1980 to now, 30 years ago? One, if we look historically, we can see from the inception of Darum Chandibigo Limited, which is in Kunupia, what is the what is the byproduct? What is the what is the effect of those who have graduated over the years in Trinidad and regionally as well? What 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 entities have spilled out of that? You understand what I'm saying? The idea is that if we talk about structure, we, we go uh, in education and we look at for Islam isolation Islamic education in Trinidad. We can see that there's a pattern of historical effect which has, which is a which have occurred over the last 30 years, especially in Trinidad. How many ulemas, maulanas that we can say and be proud of that we have locally produced and parents want to have find thousands of dollars to send them away to study? How many half is the uh, brother Hashim mentioned? Where is son graduated from? Right here. So if there was no structure of education, of Islamic education, then we would not have been attaining and graduating and chilling out graduates over the last 20 years in Trinidad and Tobago. So one, so one shock that you are saying that is that the Madaris, mocked up system, the Madaris, the, the Islamic schools, mashallah, um, as Islam is growing in Trinidad, we are seeing that there are much more schools. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of these efforts from all those who are making effort in propagating and um, teaching the deen. Um, there, were, there were two questions that was asked. One, just, I just, before yes, I just, just quickly, yeah, time quickly. Is going, and if the Islamic education was not perceived to be of something of interest, then, for example, like the Darum of Transvego Limited, the police, com the community police secretariat, one actually want to partner with Darum Transvego Limited to help them as a means of intervention to the community and family and that kind of thing. 
If in their mind it was not making any sense, would they have subscribed to the room for help and assistance in terms of com community intervention? So, it's a, some, so something is going right, inshallah, with the approach and the structure and the certification of the Islamic education in Trinidad and Tobago. Alhamdulillah. Um, the question that was, that, that was, yes. Yeah, try, try to make it short, inshallah. Eh? Yeah. Let's don't shoot down the messenger. The brother is making some wonderful points. And we take it with a sense of humility. If we should amalgamate all of the concerns here, it is telling all of us here in our Jamaat or in each Jamaat in Trinidad, there should be one or two people who is skilled and trained in helping our young boys and girls in drug addiction, in helping husband and wife in husband and wife problems. There should be, you know, an agent of every Jamaat to assist when people are having their social problem, you know, besides the academic ones. And he's asking, what is there? It's like we still have to. There have been a lot of effort all over Trinidad. But we still have to reach to that point where, you know, as we have this floor, this is a place that we kneel long for Salat, but that is our office where on Monday from 8 to 4, you can go in there and you can talk to someone about your daughter or your son who is on drugs. We still need to reach that place if we have not reached that place as yet. So in other words, we still have to work on getting a proper structure in place. But that's so it's a very con a very good concern and we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Muslims and bless us here that um, there would be a proper structure in place to deal with these many issues. You know, everyone has their own little path and their own little jamaat and so on to deal with it. So mashallah, this forum here is one of those things. You know, we ask that Allah SWT accept it. Now the question that, that the, the, that was asked by the sisters about the makeup and so on and how to advise, um, uh, a, a, a person's daughter as regarding the peer pressure that she is facing from her friends and so on as regarding the makeup. I'll ask Mufti Abdul Rahman. He probably has to deal with that. <laughs> Mashallah. So first of all, we have to understand that there is obviously a Islamic fiki viewpoint on what makeup is and what it is used for and whether or not it is halal or haram. But today's forum is not for that. Today is really about how to help our youths accept and get in line with what Allah wants from them. Okay, alhamdulillah. So in other words, to add to that, probably the, the, the point that was made earlier about developing the trust and the confidence right. between children and parents, it will also deal with that issue as well. Dr. Asim, is that right? right? I would also like to add that one of the questions Mullah Abdul Manan asked was, are there enough halal opportunities? I, 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 and he kind of stopped in the middle of the question. So I don't know if the halal opportunities mean job opportunities or opportunities for free mingling of the sexes. So if it's the first one, then opportunities in the job market are many. Opportunities for the free intermingling of the sexes where makeup would really be useful is not really there. And it's not something that we want to do either. Because that goes back to how to choose your spouse. Is there anyone here who thinks an 18, 19, 20, 25 year old person could choose their own spouse? My show of hands? Anybody? Very few people who think. Well, there are some people who are afraid to resign. So. <laughs> very few people who think that a young person is capable of choosing their own spouse on their own. And it just so happens that Islam tells us that a person's parents should be involved in choosing their spouse. I didn't say that Islam say that choose your spouse for you and ram it down your throat. I said involved in the choice. So where is there need for a free intermingling sex with makeup for them? If Islam is going to be involved and your parents going to be involved and where is there need for that halal opportunity of intermingling of the sexes? This is something for us to think about. The youth today 
they have the question in the back of their mind that why it is my parents must choose my spouse for me and that goes back to education that takes you away from Islam and it goes back to the dream that is being implemented in the hearts of our children that is a false dream we should instead as Muslim parents implant in the children of our in, in our children the Islamic dream that dream that you have to think about okay. that dream of Jannah Inshallah. Mashallah. So that is the overall dream of everyone to go into Jannah. Now, an important thing that we came about from the whole discussion is that home life in dealing with our children. Home life is the important thing. You know, um, Dr. Asim was mentioning about that the importance of that home life and development of trust. I would just like to him to elaborate. How do we get that trust from? You know, how do we develop that? What are some of the steps that can be taken? Because this now becomes a solution to many of the other issues. So we can address that, inshallah, some of the main points. We don't have too much of time. After his contribution, we'll just take two more questions. And then we'll sort of, um, because time is already half past eight. Alhamdulillah, I just signal that the importance of this, your interaction, is, is um, it, it tells us that. Mashallah. So Dr. Hassan? The way you talk to your children. The language we use, the tone we use in the language, the absence or the presence of sarcasm. We know what sarcasm is. More importantly is the belief you have in your child to do something. Whether it is to cook a meal or to clean the house, your child will know from day one if you as a father or mother believe in them meaning believe that they can do something you hear little children saying my daddy don't believe i will pass an exam my daddy don't believe i'll do good in maktab my mommy my money my mommy does always say i can't cook your belief in your children must be translated in how you relate, how you communicate, your smile, how much you praise them. Our children might do one good thing and we might not know. They might do five good things, no reward. They might do one bad thing and it's half an hour quarrel. Reward them more than you curse and punish them. Um, scientific knowledge tells us you want your child to come close to you ignore forget delete avoid mentioning too much all the negatives and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says this if you see one good thing in your child nearing the day of judgment which is now blow it up make it big talk about it over and over and over and your child does something wrong and something right, praise them, smile, tell somebody else. Let one or two members of the family tell the child. You know something, when our children do something wrong, you go and tell your father, your mother, you know what my daughter do, you know what my son do. When they do something good, go and tell the neighbor too. Tell the wife, tell the husband, tell everybody. And when you do this, the children will feel important. They will feel special. They will begin to trust you. Because it is you who making them feel special. It is you who making them feel nice and worthy and on top of the world. Jazakallah. Um, Molana, you have another question there? Uh, on the other side, we have parents are often blamed for not having a good relationship with their kids. And maybe Dr. Samir be more aware of this question. But we parents cook clean, wash, wash their clothes, personally drop them off at school, provide both Islamically and financially. And yet, we may still have kids who do not take us on. What is the solution for this? What are the other answers parents can do or to get through on this situation? What must of course it is? 
a lot of parents want their child to live the life that they wanted to live when they were younger. A parent wanted to be a doctor, a lawyer, and teacher. So what the parents does when the child grows up? Go to UTT and UWI and sign up the children. A mother always wanted to be a nurse. She couldn't because maybe she got pregnant. The father couldn't go to university because maybe he had to stay home to see about the other children. So when the child grows up, you have to go to university, you have to become a nurse. The other thing is, when much of us, I speak about my own self, when much of us would have done wrong things in life, listen carefully, must have done several wrong things. How come while your children growing up now, you are so rigid, you are so serious, you are so careful, you are watching them wherever they go. But when you were growing up, you did the opposite. You lived a free life, you live a life, all different type of things you could have done that in the name of wrong is like now you say to yourself, I did all those wrong things, my child should not do it. And therefore you set out. Psychologically, it's like you have the child here, and this is you with a string. And you know you control and you dictate. And you are so rigid in all your dealings. Because you don't want the child to do what? To be how you were when you were growing up. But Dr. Hassan, doesn't that, um, you know, the aspect of Islamic terbia, in that a parent's duty is to guide the child and steer them away from wrong thing and guide them to that which is wrong. So a person would have undergone those type of things when they were, when they were young, growing up. And they don't want their children to go through that. So would it not be justified for a parent to do that? Not necessarily. Because you will hear young people say, my mother like a military leader. My father don't want me to do this. He don't want me to do that. And I can't even step, I just use an example, I can't even step outside. But when a child hear about the life, I'm not saying you all. When a child hear about the life the father used to live, the mother used to live, the dreams the father had and the mother have, you force the child to do what you wanted to do is not right. Your child should not live the life and the dream you wanted to. Again, everything comes back to, I'm not saying to let children be free, but you must give them a percentage of freedom, you know, to go there, pull back, go there, pull back. But the fa there are some fathers and mothers who will not want the child even to go there. There is always this rain and rope of control. The controlling mother, the controlling daughter. Now I'm not saying, I'm very, very careful here, that you should not be in control. Be in control and controlling is two different things. Be in control, you are the father, you are the mother. But controlling means the rigidity of the life that the children are living. And when you behave, you know, a young girl just recently told me, I don't know why my mother went to sign me up in UTT. After six months, she dropped out. And when we did some investigation, it is because the mother always, a young mother always had his dream to go to UTT, that university. So, well, yes, I couldn't go. So my daughter, you know, so she went and signed up. Daughter drop out, don't want to do that. And we do it in several, many other ways. I'll use a term, we do it subliminally. Subliminally means what? Unconsciously. Okay, I dealt with a case quite recently. Uh, a mother, a mother, she always beating up the husband. Nice boy, relatively nice boy, real nice husband. So when I intervene, why always beating up the husband? One day, she beaten up her. Eh? One day, she and her husband, they were playing, and her husband raised the hand on her. I said, and she started to get on, run out. She even leave and went by her mother. Husband just raised the hand, they were playing. I go hit here. That's actually what he did. You know what happened? 
her father used to beat her mother. Her father used to beat her. Badly, they had to run out of the house. She grew up in an abuse home. So she frightened if the husband raised her hand. And why she study hitting the husband? Relics. Somebody with a belt. She's lashing out because that's the home she grew up in. And sometimes we lash out on our, our children subliminally and we do not know that we are lashing out. So For example, he, so, what, so what you are saying is that we need to be in control, not controlling. Yeah, we and can't that, be controlled. That's the bottom line. Yeah, that's the key word. Okay. That's the bottom line. I, w I want to get more like Sean involved in that aspect of, of the, the tarbia because from an Islamic perspective, a, um, a parent role in guiding a child, of course, when they talk about giving the leeway and pulling back and so on, that is part of tarbia. Understand? Giving a responsibility. So, do you see any contradiction in what um, is being mentioned here? One thing is to, is to give free reign, and next thing is to be, as you mentioned, in control. Um, Alhamdulillah. One of the things as parents, um, as Brother um, Hasim has mentioned, with regards to parents being in control, I will just like, I mean, I cannot measure up with him, eh? so I'm not trying to. And that's me from the Islamic aspect right. of it. So one of the things is that as parents, we have to be the role models in our homes. Many a times, our language that we speak is different from our actions. And there's contradiction. And our children see it. So as Maulana Manan was asking the question about makeup, and the parent is having problems with the makeup, and the mother is wearing makeup, and you want the child not to wear makeup, or the father is smoking, and he's telling his young son, you don't smoke enough, or he's drinking, there is double standards. So as parents, we have to set the example through our actions. And by doing so, this will also make it easy. One other thing I want to add to this. Parents should learn the language of their children. Many a times as parents, we don't understand the language of our children. If your child come home and you say, I'm not hungry, did you pick up on that? And you know that this is his favorite meal. He's not hungry. Speak to him. Sometimes you will see a reaction. He's behaving in a particular way. You have to learn the language of our children. Body language, that is. And secondly, their way of speech. Because the young people have a way how they communicate with their peers. So you as a parent also have to learn that way. You have to keep up with them. Right? And I will close there. Okay. Um, you know, we have... Going beyond the schedule time, um, Molana should be close off there or just enter in one question. That's it. Okay, I want to give all of you all one minute to give your final comments on your topic. I know we have just any open the can, so to say. Right? The, the topic has now started to get heated and Alhamdulillah, I'm seeing the interest of everyone. So just um, starting off with, uh, with Brother Yazid, the reaction right. Um, just give us some closing comments um, probably throw in one solution that you feel necessary right <coughs> um, I think we should have a part two um, for this inshallah <laughs> sometime in the near future talk to the management of BDF <laughs> in, in conclusion <coughs> for today's part one <coughs> as Muslims first of all we need to identify what is our purpose in this life why we are here and where we are going afterwards. And as part of our belief as Muslims, our first, our first existence in this world is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, and inshallah then the Jannah will come. But <clears throat> we should be also mindful on the things that we employ and what is perceived to be that these are the entities that is perceived as helpers that will give us a better standard of life, a better quality of life. Being educated is a very good thing. I will encourage anybody, any parent who wants to send a children to attain tertiary education at up to the PhD level. But inshallah, at the same time, the deen Islam should always be first and they should never compromise your deen and your iman for education. And this is the biggest challenge we have today is how do people, what they give up and what they hold on to. 
So inshallah, my recommendation is based on experience and, and based on experience is that hold on to your deen and adopt a holistic approach with both Islamic and academic education, inshallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Mola Shon. In closing, what I would like to say is that our youths is our investment. Our youths is our future. And if it is we, we don't take, take care, care of them, them nobody, nobody would do the favor for us. And one, and one of the suggestions, suggestions towards, towards our problem, problem that, that I'm seeing is the generation, generation gap. gap. There is a huge division, separation gap, gap between, between those who are considered, considered to be the elders in the community or the elderly people in the community and the youngsters in the community. And many a times, as Muslims, we do not follow the saying of the Rasul The Prophet said, he says, you are not from amongst us those who do not show respect to your elders. So our youngsters, you have to show respect to your elders. You have to be willing to listen and take advice. An intelligent person that one was able to take advice. They have went through the hoops. They have went through the hoops. They have experienced life. So the first aspect is to take, take advice. advice. And, and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, says he's not from amongst us, those who do not have mercy on the youngsters. youngsters. So, so our elders have, have mercy on the youngsters. youngsters. Speak, Speak to them. As Brother um, Hisham had, uh, ha Hasim had mentioned, even hugging, a little hug. Sometimes a youth come in the masjid, he's having problems. We don't know the kind of problems he's having. Sonny, what's happening? Hole in his hand. This in itself, is a, it will take us far, inshallah. Jazakallah. Can I cut in short, Molana? Sorry about that, Molana. To those mothers who are listening, don't let your daughters be your daughters, but let your daughters be your friend. Don't let your sons be your sons, but let your sons be your friend. To all of us here who give speech, dawa, give lectures, kutbah, sometimes it might be good hikmah to watch who is in the crowd. If we have a lot of young people, it might be good wisdom not to speak too much about the hellfire and the punishment and the depths of the Jahannam and the punishment in the grave. Rather, give your kutbah, give your speech, you could modify it on the beauties of Islam, on the speciality of a young boy or a young girl, the importance of a young boy or a young girl in this life. That Jannah was created for you. The heavens were created for you young boys, for you young girls. Allah decorated that place. And that place is waiting for you. Rather than tell them the grave and the hellfire is waiting for them. Jazakallah. And um, continue to you know, give you that tawfiq to assist and help in your field, Mufti Abdurrahman, Mullah Sean, Brother Yazid, all of you all and, you know, a uh, form of appreciation. And I see that the crowd is very attentive and patient. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept you, your being here, accept your fikr, and um, that he give tawfiq and success from this gathering. An important point that I would just want to leave with as well, and that is, um, uh, what uh, Dr. Asim had mentioned, that sometimes there are a lot of comforts in the home, but yet we are detached from the family. And this sometimes becomes one of the root cause of the problem that we, 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 we consider as being dangers of the youth. Now, in my sphere of thing, there are a lot of dangers. And uh, if we were to consider a sort of an image, just imagine you have a circle of different dangers, drugs, peer pressure, um, even from the family members, um, all these different things and the youth are in the middle and every side they turn there's some danger there's something that they cannot relate to as being something that would help them and guide them as parents as guardians as friends as Muslims as human beings we have a responsibility and that responsibility is to make ourselves um, uh, were the servants of Allah and at the same time assist one another 
in becoming the servants of Allah to try to save us from this danger. And remember, as many of the brothers have mentioned, the ultimate thing is how we can please Allah, we can reach this Jannah, we can be saved from the Jahannam. And at the same time, you know, we, I end with the, with the word of the Quran. Allah SWT says, Ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and save your family from that fire. So, you know, with these words, again, I thank every one of you all.